sobre la gobernanza del uso good, de la fuerza policial. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this seminar on the use of police force. This event is part of the agreement signed in October 2020 between the CAF and the University of Los Andes, particularly with the Alberto Lleras Camargo School of Government, to collaborate at the national and international level in the study and research of governance in the security sector in Colombia and the region. We thank the CAF, the authors of the study, Gary White and Natalia Escobar, and Maria Teresa Gonzalez Esquivel, who collaborate on it, as well as the Kingdom of the Netherlands for funding it. The legitimate use of force is a central theme of democracy. The definitions of the legal regulatory framework, the decision-making process to use force, the supervision, monitoring, and control systems, and the culture of the organizations authorized to use force are the aspects that define the governance governance of the use of force. This is an event where the CAF will launch or publish for the first time this study, and we will have a luxury panel to talk about the lessons that this study brings to us here in Colombia. This event will have simultaneous translation on the lower right-hand right -hand corner of your screen, you will find the icon to access the simultaneous interpretation channels. The, this event will be recorded in both languages and will be available for later replay. At the end of the event, we will have a space for question and answers. So as the event unfolds, if you have any questions, you can start typing them in the Q&A tab. And at the end of the event, we will have a perception survey that might be a bit cumbersome, but for us, it is very useful for, for you to tell us what you thought of the event. So I want to thank you for being with us today and I wish to also thank our panelists, obviously the authors and the CAF. And now I will hand over the floor to Ambassador Thomas Guber, Director of the CAF, the Geneva Center for the Governance of in the security sector. Distinguished Go ahead, President. Ambassador. Distinguished President of the Senate of the Colombian Republic, Distinguished other honorable members of parliament, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. I'm absolutely delighted that I have the honor of opening this webinar on the governance of police use of force. I do not often have the privilege of listening to and learning from panelists as influential, experienced and knowledgeable as the ones represented on our panel today. And I will of course be particularly interested in listening to the panelists' interventions because what we will hear directly relates to the very core of the mandate of DCAF, Geneva Center for Security Sector Governance, the organization which I represent. For 20 years, DCAF has supported security sector governance and reform processes around the world by assisting partner states in developing laws, institutions, policies, and good practices. Our organization supports capacity building of state, civil society, and private sector stakeholders by providing access to independent expertise and legal and policy advice and by creating innovative knowledge products. DCAF is often referred to as a leading center of excellence for security sector governance and reform and one of the most powerful repository where information on international best practice can be found and where guidance is available to those who wish to know which reforms, including police reforms, have or haven't worked and why. This repository of good international practice is based on DCAF's programs in over 80 countries, 
which we've developed over the past two decades. Given our significant geographical footprint, you will not be surprised to hear that DCAF's Foundation Council, which is the organization's supreme governance body, has a very international composition. It is made up of representatives of 60 member states and the canton of Geneva, headquartered at the so-called Maison de la Paix in Geneva, DCAF currently has 13 field offices abroad, including one in Latin America, in Honduras. Today's webinar takes place at a critical juncture in the development of Colombia's security sector. While the, government, while the country has seen encouraging progress in the implementation of the 2016 Peace Accord, the last years and months have also shown that challenges continue to exist. And some of them directly relate to issues such as freedom of assembly or peaceful protest on the one hand, and the role of law enforcement and the police on the other. Considering the police reform process recent, recently initiated or uh, reinvigorated by President Duque, and considering the important role which the Colombian Congress will have to play in this process, along with many other stakeholders, today's panel and DICA's new publication on the police use of force could really not have come at a more timely moment. DCAF has been supporting the Colombian National Police since 2017 through projects on security and gender, the media, and the use of force. And let me say that this has really been a most gratifying and enriching partnership. Given the importance of police use of force and its central centrality to both police legitimacy and effectiveness, DCAF, with the general the generous uh, support of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, has developed this new publication we're presenting today, which outlines a framework for ensuring good governance and accountability regarding the use of force by the police. The publication aims to provide both policymakers and international practitioners and partners who support related reform efforts with guidance on the key elements which drive governance of the use of force by the police. And those elements are firstly, effective rule of law, which is about how and within which normative framework the police is allowed to use force. Secondly, human resources, which is about the challenge of selecting, preparing and equipping those who will use force. And thirdly, accountability, which relates to the checks and balances necessary to ensure appropriate oversight and compliance. The publication presented today provides guidance which is as relevant and applicable to Colombia as it is to countries such as France, the US, South Africa, or Switzerland. The content of the publication looks at the use of force from the governance and a structural perspective with a view to identifying gaps and facilitating better decision-making at the strategic level. It does not provide any operational guidance on how to address issues related to the use of force. If there is one lesson ECAF has learned through its longstanding engagement in a multitude of different contexts, it is that the governance and accountability perspective on the use of force of police forces is absolutely essential to build and maintain an effective, legitimate and accountable police force in any democratic country. Citizens need to be confident that the institution granted with special powers to enforce the law also observes the law itself, protects citizens' rights, and is accountable for the way in which it fulfills the responsibilities with which it has been entrusted. Even though this insight is not new, the use of police force has more recently come under renewed scrutiny in many different national contexts. 
be it in the context of the management of public assemblies and demonstrations, or in the context of more routine police functions, such as searches, seizures, or arrests. Maybe this recent scrutiny or attention is also due to the fact that police officers are often obviously the most visible representatives of the state. And certainly the COVID-19 pandemic has further revealed and sometimes even exacerbated tensions which may exist between the police or other law enforcement agencies and various groups of societies. This, in some cases, triggering waves of civil unrest in many different contexts around the globe. I see the issue of good governance related to the use of force as absolutely key to any attempt to professionalize the security sector, close legitimacy gaps, and ensure compliance with international norms and best practice. The emphasis should be on strengthening legal frameworks, strengthening transparency and citizen participation, making operational guidelines gender sensitive, improving human resources management within law enforcement institutions, and reinforcing external and internal accountability mechanisms. All of this requires changes of norms, but also changes of cultures, institutional cultures and behaviors. Given DCAF's deep experience with such transformational processes, we would be delighted if we could further deepen and broaden our engagements, cooperation and partnership with a wide array of Colombian part stakeholders who play a role in this process. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, let me use this opportunity to thank the government of the Netherlands for the generous contribution that they've made in support of our work in Colombia and the development of this publication in particular we're presenting today. Let me also thank the Universidad de los Andes and in particular it's Alberto Leros Camargo School of Government, which has played an essential role in organizing this event and in advancing our collective knowledge related to the governance of, of police use of force. Thank you very much for your attention and I wish you a stimulating discussion. Muchas gracias, señor embajador. Eh, mil gracias por su presentación. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you for your presentation. We will now, how, now hand over the floor to Cristina Hoyos. I talk about Cristina as if everybody knows her, so I will take a few minutes to introduce her. Cristina Hoyos is Colombian. She is the director for Latin America and the Caribbean of the CAF. And it is with Christina that we have been organizing this alliance that we have at the School of Government and the CAF to study issues regarding security. So, Christina, welcome and go ahead, please. First of all, Paca, thank you for giving me this opportunity and good morning to everybody in Colombia. Good afternoon. Those that are in Europe, it is my pleasure to welcome you from Geneva. First of all, I would like to say that at DCAF, we feel very honored to have you participating in this event that is not only key for Colombia, but for the international context. I'm personally very happy that we have more than 2,300 people listening, which reflects the clear interest on the issue of governance of the use of force by the police. I would also like to thank Margarita Zuleta, director of the School of Government at University of Los Andes for opening up this space and organize this event. These type of scenarios are very important for dialogue and for the experiences that we can exchange between ourselves. Given the interest at the global level, we think that it is very timely to launch our publication on the use of police force, a framework to guarantee good governance 
on the use of force in this platform. We all know that the police force is facing very dynamic and complex scenarios regarding citizen coexistence, creating challenges in order to guarantee and protect human rights. Colombia is the first country where we will we are at, where we have, are launching for the first time this publication because I think it is very important to have a technical discussion and, and provide the adjustments to support innovation in the security forces that are underway today. I would like to highlight the work that we have been doing in Latin America, where we are developing projects, not only in Colombia, but in Honduras and Chile. In Honduras, we are providing support through our office in Tegucigalpa to the security secretary and the National Police of Honduras in the reform process, working on areas, among others, a community police, the issue of gender that is very important, the use of police force, trust internally and externally. And this is all thanks to the support of the Swiss government. Together with the Honduran government, BCAF is contributing to the implementation of the peace accords in Colombia, creating opportunities for women that leave live in the security areas, express the, their needs for access to security. We are also insisting to the national police on the imp implementation of a gender self-assessment, which is a tool developed by DCAF to contribute towards making it an institution that promotes equitable participation. Since 2000, 18, we have been supporting the Congress of the Republic of Colombia in strengthening its role in legislative supervision of the security sector through capacity building, best practices and regulation, and especially in producing knowledge that we think is very important part of the process. Together with the National Police and with the support of the Chancellor's Office in the Republic of Germany, where it's working to strengthen the role of journalists and social leaders in supervising the security sector together with the Association for Liberty of Press and the YouTubers School. With this project, DCAF is promoting mutual responsibility between the police, the media, at the local level and civil society leaders promoting the respect for the rights of others. As the director mentioned, DCAF is an excellence center, it is an impartial center. In, in Latin America, is focused on disseminating, promoting, and accompanying transformation processes towards a better understanding of the security sector that gives an adequate answer to the needs of the population. The reality of each country is completely different. And what we want with the work of our specialized team is to analyze in detail what are the local needs and institutional needs and how we can adapt the principle of good governance so that they are relevant and effective. This is why we have been working with local actors and we ensure to collaborate with different stakeholders, including civil society organizations, the police, the media, and legislative bodies. In this way, we are ensuring this neutrality and objectivity. We believe that through this type of events, we can contribute towards understanding governance from a perspective of trust, trust, transparency, and accountability between state institutions and civil institutions and civilians. We hope that we contribute with ideas to overcome the challenge that we have and do it together. Thank you for listening.
Thank you, Cristina. We already have many questions on logistics issues. So before we hand over the floor to Natalia Escobar that will present her, the document, I wanted to say something that I repeated at the beginning. I said at the beginning, but it's possible you didn't hear. This event is being translated into English or into Spanish. At the lower right hand corner of the screen, there's an icon, the language interpretation icon. If you want to listen to the Spanish translation or the English translation, you have to click on this button. This event is being recorded and the CAV and the School of Government will make it available on their websites or on the DCAF YouTube channel. We will let you know in a timely manner. At the end of our panel discussion, we will have a Q&A session. If you have questions on this, uh, or Natalia's presentations are around the panel discussion, you can write them down on the Q&A tab. Natalia, como les decía, es uno de los autores de, de este, de este... We now hand over the floor to Natalia, one of the authors of this study, and she will, she is the project coordinator at DICAF. She specializes in police reform, use of force, and public protest management. Welcome, Natalia. Natalia, tienes el micrófono apagado. Uh -huh. sí. gracias, Paca. Antes de empezar, una pregunta, ¿pueden ver? Thank you, Paca. Before I begin, can you see my presentation on the screen? Yes. Good morning, everybody. For those of you in Latin and North America, good afternoon. Those of you, of you joining us from Europe or other countries around the world, thank you for your interest and participation in this event. A special thank you to our panelists that represent several of the most important stakeholders in the issue of use of police force. What we are seeing are images of what happens in an increasing manner in Europe, Latin America, Asia, the United States. The debate on the use of police force is very complex and requires a systemic and holistic view. It is the police that has the legitimate right to use force, but it is society that has given them this right. And we need to ensure that there are mechanisms that ensure that force is used correctly. This debate has everything to do with the legitimacy and the, of the police force and the trust that citizens place on them. These images tell us that this trust is waning because violence against the police is also a fact. And this is a phenomenon that not only affects Colombian society, but other societies around the world. This graph or this slide shows us how trust is essential for the proper use of force by the police. Public trust, police effectiveness, and legitimacy are intertwined. Public trust will derive from a system of good governance, which implies accountability, transparency, and integrity in all aspects of police activities, but in particularly on the issue of use of force. On this slide, or where we saw images and that have captured moments in time, it is not possible to see if force is being used under the principles of legitimacy, precaution, need, proportionality, non-discrimination, and accountability. To determine this, this respect for basic principles of use of force and also respect for human rights, it is necessary to see this issue from a systemic point of view, more concretely on the governance system. The publication that we present today tackles the different pillars of a governance systems along the dimensions 
of organizational and external and individual to guarantee that what happens in practice reflects what the regulations say. I would like to highlight that this publication looks at the use of police force in all its aspects, also um, in social protest, but it can be also used in different scenarios as the Mr. Ambassador said, this includes searches, arrests, among others. And this full spectrum is uh, taken into account by our publication. The pillars of good governance that we developed for this study is threefold, rule of law, human rights, and accountability. I will talk briefly of the three. The rule of law is the basis for everything. The policies and internal guides derive from this and the gaps between what the norms say and what happens on the streets is, is something that we cannot deny. But it is also tied to the legislative framework. So the first step is to guarantee a clear and integral and a framework that is aligned to international standards. For legislation to be effective, we need, on the one hand, the commitment to values of democracy. And on the other hand, we need the police to make sure that all of its members know and have internalized these rules. This part internalization is very important because it's not enough for them to have read the rules. They need to be able to act in accordance with the rules and apply them. The second pillar of our publication refers to human rights. In this image, I would like for you to look at it in detail because it's an opportunity to reflect on this second pillar. What do you see in this image? What I particularly see on both sides of the confrontation are human beings that are experiencing intense emotions and stress. Both are under extreme pressure and both, especially the ones on the left, need to get a grip on their emotions. Both parties need to respect the other. Now, the people on the left have responsibilities and powers that are more, are, uh, that are broader than those on the right. And this implies several things. On the one hand, those that are empowered to use force should have the skills to do it correctly. They need to be able to make correct decisions at the correct time to imply good judgment. And because in most cases, it will not, they, they cannot know what type of situation they will face and they need to be always have the, the state of mind to make correct decisions at the correct time. This involves good training for the police forces, which needs to focus on the alternatives to the use of force. For example, nonviolent conflict resolution, de-escalation techniques, and communication and persuasion techniques, among others. Members of the police force need to be inclusive and reflect the diversity of the communities they serve. Another implication has to do with equipment. International guidelines offer guides on the use of lethal and non-lethal tools and weapons. I would like to just touch upon two subjects, report and training on the use of lethal weapons and non-lethal weapons. The issue of reporting has to do with the third pillar of the system of good governance that we devised for the study. It has to do with accountability that is made up of internal and external mechanisms that also involve different stakeholders, obviously including the police themselves, but also supervising bodies, legislative bodies and civil society. 
this is a particularly important component. They are, yes, all three pillars are important, but this pillar is the one that will determine how much trust people place on the police force and the legitimacy. This accountability should not be only on paper. It needs to be palpable. When you create a, an accountability culture on how and why force was used, we set the basis to comply with the rules that we talked about in the first pillar. We increase transparency and credibility of this institution. And also we dissuade against unlawful actions. A system that is solid and based on this type of culture and also articulated with effective external mechanisms is the key to the governance, good go governance of the use of force. These three pillars are developed in detail in the publication that we are presenting today. I invite you to read it. They will be available on the DCAP website and on the website of the School of Government of Universidad de Los Andes. You will see, uh, get to read about examples from different countries, from Slovenia to Philippines and also Latin America. An important conclusion in this study is that there is no one perfect system or model. It's not that we have a formula that can be applied to all police for forces. We present practices whose underlying principles can be applied specifically in each context. And to talk about the Colombian context, I hand the floor back to Paca Zuleta so that she can continue with the panel discussion. Thank you. Natalia, thank you. And I also invite you that once this event is over, you can download a the study, which is available both in English and in Spanish. As I said before, we have a luxury panel for today, and we wish to thank everybody for accepting our invitation. I would like to start by apologizing to the President of the Congress, because we will not go through official protocols to be able to organize the conversation according that we had uh, talked about. So I offer our apologies, but I think it's going to be interesting to do it in a, this way. We have with us today President of the Congress of the Republic of Colombia, Juan Diego Gomez, a Senator of the Republic, a lawyer that has been working on lately on issues of relating to security. With great diligence, he has had a good, his professional life has been dedicated to being a public servant. So thank you to the President of the Congress for being with us today. We also have Brigadier Luis Ernesto Hernandez, the Office of the Planning Department of the National Police Force of Colombia, and he is in charge of reform and innovation. Thank you for being with us today. We also have Ambassador Juan Carlos Pinzon that has been with us in several events uh, involving the CAF and the School of Government. Uh, Mr. Ambassador was uh, also, as you know, Minister of Defense and has been working on issues regarding uh, related to defense for many years. Uh, from the also administrative and budgetary points of view. We also have with us today, today Arlene, Arlene Dichter. Arlene Dichter, she is professor at the University of Rosario. She has also been working at the University of Los Andes at the time. She's an expert on security issues. We also have Hugo Acero. Hugo, as you know, was secretary of security for the district of Bogotá two occasions. This is a legal perspective. And Hugo, we have also people that are listening from Mexico, Peru. But we also have master students in Monterrey. And for them, the local perspective is very important. So thank you, Hugo, for being with us. 
here today. And I also have Mama Liliana Pachene Muelas. Thank you for being with us here today. And I think that your perspective will offer a very different perspective and will help us to provide the diversity that we need on discussing these issues. We will obviously talk to them about the DECAF document from the perspective of public policy management. I will ask them a series of questions, each directed to a different panelist. Each panelist will have five minutes to answer uh, the question and make the comments uh, they wish to do on the, to make on the publication. We will first ask three panelists and it's possible that we circle back and then we will move on to the next three panelists to go through the same exercise. And we will three interventions. We will ask each panelist if they wish to comment on the what the other panelists have said. As I said, we are not going to follow the protocol given for official events. We define the order according to the issues that we want to touch on today. So we, I, I offer my excuses once again to the president of the Congress, Juan Diego. So we will start with Brigadier. In general, the DCAF recommendations cover rules, procedures, human talent management, recruiting, training, equipment, support, and accountability, as Natalia and the ambassador told us just now. How should we use these recommendations in the framework of the, of the reform of the National Police Project on which you are working on right now? And in particular, how should we use them in the framework of social protest? Thank you, General. Thank you, Paca. And thank you, everybody, for being with us today. I will wish to thank the CAF for publishing this study because obviously a good governance model impacts public policy and especially public services that are provided not only in Colombia, but throughout Latin America and the world. First of all, I would place people in context because there are very different viewers tuned in with us today. Talk about the Colombian context because in, in Colombia, the issue of governance has been tied to security and uh, citizen coexistence for the last three years. And it is important to define that there's some instruments that have been created in Colombia, legal instruments that help towards strategic planning, interinstitutional cooperation in Colombia. However, I would like to say that in Colombia, there are two types of public services, the police service that is provided by police force. It is a public service, which is essential for our Colombians. But we also have a service called citizen security. It is a decentralized service in charge of territorial entities in Colombia. One of the differ differentiating characteristics of this type of service is that legitimate and correct use of force and weapons. It's one of the singular characteristics that differentiate it from, differentiate it from other public services. And I'd also like to say that that the CAF study invites us to distinguish the use of force by police professionals. In Colombia, the police force provide many services like criminal investigation and others. And in other countries, other forces provide these services, but it is important to distinguish the use of force by the police in the missionary 
activities, we have three definitions. When number one is to protect private property, we use it crime control, or when we regulate social behavior, we call it prevention of crime in Colombia. And the main instrument that we have is that is law 1801 in Colombia. There is a law which is called law 1801, which is the code of citizen conduct to regulate social behavior. And there's a third time when we use a force, which is to maintain public control to guarantee institutional institutionality, which is exerted, exercised by uh, police officers that accompany social protests and also anti-rioting squads. This is the three scenarios in which uh, legitimate, legitimate force can be used. This is the, one of the main characteristics of the police service and it is exerted by the police to guarantee public rights and liberties. We also have important elements that the national police is working on to transform itself. At the, it started in the 22nd of December, but the police since the 90s has been working hard to transform itself and always be up to date in this case we have developed a transformation model that together with the national government and internet and international institutions it has this transformation has three parts a high level work table made up of seven people appointed by the national government this is a technical work group that will allow dialogue with organized citizens groups the second element is civil society, with which we have began talks and negotiations facilitated by this work group that are, and, and a commission of it, which has police members and members of the IDB. And there's a third aspect of this transformation, which are 10 dynamic work teams within the police force so that all initiatives that come in can be implemented by these. We also have four projects that fall under this transformation project. The first is a bill that is before Congress, which is a bill regarding the professional career of a police man or woman. We also have the new disciplinary code for the police. The third is a modification to our institutional architecture. And the fourth has to do with legitimacy and public trust. I would like to comment briefly on each of them in terms of the police career, professional, professional police career. One of the important aspects of the transformation has to review the career of a police man or woman. And here we created a chapter that regulates the path of a policeman or woman from entry until retirement. We have mandatory courses that need to be recertified permanently. We also have in this project an update to our bylaws as well as the strengthening of the policy on follow-up of mental health among the police force. And I can tell you that the new discipline code, disciplinary code has been reviewing an universal jurisdiction. And we talk about accountability and we also want permanent research within the police force. Citizen participation is also an element of this project creating a system that guarantees access to a complaint services of the police. With this, we are modernizing access of citizens to the police force. The internal architecture creates an office for human rights. 
the School of Human Rights within the police force and also the Observatory of Human Rights and uh, gender policy within the police. This is an important element. Uh, this third element is modernizing our institutional architecture with which we seek to have greater capacity to create synergies within the police force and create greater strengthening of the observance of human rights. I would end Paca by saying that the police force has always been working hard on strengthening, as Mr. Ambassador said, when he mentioned the work that has been doing with it, has been done at the police the last decade, improving on two aspects and working with the Swiss government, we have working on the tactical aspects of police action to strengthen these policies. We are going to launch our gender policy. We are doing this uh, September 9th, which is also part of international cooperation. Switzerland and DCAF have been important part of it and permanent follow-up by the Human Rights Commission within the police force, where we have prioritized the service of listening to citizen complaints, where we deal with reports of the misuse of police force, and we deal with it accordingly. We're also looking at different type of training for anti-rioting squad. We have implemented a new rule in terms of differenti differential training that involves universities and international bodies that certify each year, each one of the 5,000 members of the anti-rioting squad. We also have worked on international projects to strengthen our human rights instructors and also to strengthen the 72 offices of human rights that the police of the, the police force has throughout the territory. The legitimacy and the trust of the police force undoubtedly rests on, a, on an organizational individual dimension, but also depends on external governance. This is why policies regarding the rule of law, strengthening as you mentioned, Paga, uh, as you mentioned, decree 003, which is a decree that facilitates intervention in public protests. This is a decree that was launched together with civil society, which also prioritizes articular, articulating the mayor's offices throughout the territory to strengthen dialogues and negotiations. Also, coexistence managers is an attribution that is given to local mayors, given from Law 62, which prioritizes prior dialogues before social protests. It also involves the public ministry to review the mechanism that the anti-rioting squad have, which are in charge of protesting, of protecting public protests, which is to say that there are prior activities also parallel activities. We create a command unit that will follow uh, public protests in real time and take make decisions in terms of articulating capacity. There's also an accountability part in Decree 003, which is an important for legal framework for Colombia in terms of presenting reports when the use of force is used, as well as press communications that the police need to issue uh, explain all of their actions and interventions together with cap this is a very important instrument for good governance in colombia as i said decree the 003 the new disciplinary code and this project that gives greater access for claims and follow up on these claims, the territorial entities are now empowered and to contribute their inputs to strengthen the interventions of the police force. Thank you, Pac.
Vamos a, a... Thank you, General. We will now hand over the floor to Senator Juan Diego Gomez, current president of Congress. And the reflection that we have for him is on initiatives deriving from the Congress because the DCOP documents recommend making an assessment of existing national frameworks and to ensure compliance with international standards which in the different treaties that signed by our countries and it asks that there be a definition of principles of precaution, legality, necessity, proportionality, non-discrimination and accountability. So the question for the president of Congress is, is he thinks that this review is a task in which the Congress of the Republic would be interested in taking the initiative and promoting an agreement that involves dialogue, openness, and looking at how these principles are present or not in our legislation. And how can we make that this reflection and this review transcends the electoral cycle, that this is not something that happens now before the election, but is something that is, transcends, as I said, the electoral cycle. President Cardona, you have, President Juan Diego Gomez, you have the floor. I would like to say hello to all my fellow panelists and to all viewers. Yes, this is an initiative that has been undertaken by the Congress of the Republic that is very important on three aspects. One, the motivational aspect, motivation of the members of the police force, specifically the base where we have presented together with the national government and the director of the police, Jorge, General Jorge Vargas Valencia, it has been worked with General Garcia, which has to do with the professionalization of the police force, looking for a police force that is closer to citizens and that develops professionally through certifications and trainings. A second aspect has to do with the disciplinary code for the police. That is also uh, an aspect that has to do with strengthening the police force and the level of accountability exerted by citizens that is a way towards moving towards good governance and transparency of police actions. So the first thing that we should say on this issue is that this is a very complex debate. This is a worldwide debate as well. But we need to say that Colombia is one of the most stable democracies in Latin America, in spite of the recent events and recent discussions. But clearly, Colombia is not a country that has had a tradition of dictatorship opposed to Chile, where the origin of the police force in this country comes from the time of a dictatorship regime. We are also uh, working with the anti-rioting squad, which is called ESMAD in Colombia. Other countries have other specialized anti-rioting squads. And in some countries they are trying to make them disappear and discredit them. But I think that the message needs to be clear and it has to have three elements. The first, we need to comply with international standards. Number one, comply with international standards. This is one of the most important aspects that we have in our conversation that is part of the law, which is how to create through body cams that each member of the police force will have how to create transparency 
because every interaction will be recorded through video and audio, which creates good governance on for all stakeholders involved, which is to avoid what we recently saw some edited videos where we say this person was killed and then we saw the whole video and it is was not the whole truth. This is going to be done through this mechanism, the body cams to provide transparency. And the second aspect is that in order to ascend throughout the police force has to do with certifications and trainings that each policeman or woman has to have. This is the way they will access to greater economic benefits and promotions within their professional trajectory. And the third aspect, which I think is very important, has to do with the integral transformation of the police first step beyond going into obvious changes is to strengthen the police, making it closer to citizens and place greater accountability, especially creating the new department to oversee compliance with human rights, which will be overseen by a civilian to create transparency and independence, which will also look at how to promote accountability. I think that we can move forward towards greater citizen control on the police force with uh, public audits as well, with the public prosecutor, with disciplinary controls on the police, especially with criminal, uh, military justice or ordinary justice procedures. So we are trying to strengthen our institution, but also strengthen the citizen oversight as as it should be. Thank you. And I would like to insist on my question. Yes, you are, the Congress of the Republic is working on laws and bills that are tied to talent management as seen in the DeKalb study. I want to ask you something, which is because we are in a year that is very difficult to have this type of analysis. So I would like to insist on my question. How do you see the commitment of senators and House members, their commitment to work on the issues of good governance and police force and the correct use of police force and the governance of the use of police force looking towards the future, looking beyond this particular moment that you're working on very important issues, yes, regarding human talent. And I agree with you that we need to also look at our context, our history. Colombia has a, a very important history that we need to include, but how do you see our current congressmen and those that are going to be coming in the future. How strong this is their commitment to work on these issues? I'm sorry to insist. What I think is that this current Congress, this last legislative period that will coincide with the last year of President Duque's administration has key aspects that forces each of force each of the parties and movements and each individual congressman has to have a great commitment on these issues because we are in going through a the pandemic we are going through an economic crisis derived from the pandemic and also social demonstrations derived from it as well I do not conceive it or see it as a social crisis because it, there is no there is no one sole agenda or united agenda. I think that uh, middle class has uh, their agenda. Students, there are professional associations, transporters, etc. Indigenous communities, obviously, 
And I think that what the country needs today beyond these discussions is that we are facing a very atypical presidential campaign. It's something that we do, it is one that we do not know if it will have the same conditions as those in the past. I would say that it won't. It is very important to understand that the pandemic has changed our lives. And well, if it wasn't weren't for the pandemic, we would be in an auditorium at the University of Los Andes with uh, some of us present, some of us not. But this is something that creates an additional commitment to our country. So far, as of today, this Congress, especially the Senate, has expressed their commitment to accompany these transformations, not only the career path for policemen and women, but also the disciplinary code. And after this, we can also talk about governance of the use of force, which is a, a debate that has been ill-managed so far, because I feel that when you want to place an ideology to, to a debate of this nature, voluntary or involuntarily, this debate ends up harming our public institutions. And this is what I have felt. This is what we felt on July 20th when the National Police Force was given a standing ovation. This was a show of, solidar of solidarity. But as a, and to answer your question, I think that there is great commitment in the government and we want to move these projects forward for the benefit of society. Thank you to the president of the Senate. We will now talk to Arlene. She's an academic, so her point of view is a bit different. But I think that she will help us to understand that transformations do not occur in a void, they occur in a political reality, a reality that is often confrontational, as we just heard, and this is something that we need to take into account. There is, among the, the CAF recommendations, a recommendation that has to do with accountability. And we obviously, we aspire to having accountability to derive into trust, but I insist these transformations do not occur in a void. There is a political logic behind that we need to always bear in mind and accountability also has to know who they are being accountable to, who they are account accountable to, what citizens expect so that this accountability has a good two-way communication. So I want to ask Arlene, what type of actions does she recommend to be able to strengthen this accountability? How does she see it in terms of decision-making for the use of force and the way that we need to provide audiences with relevant information after events where police force was deemed legitimate? And how do you think this a, a model, a change in this model can contribute towards generating greater trust in the police? I don't know if it was me or if it was Paca, yes. Paca. So I will begin while Paca's connection comes back. Oh. Thank you for inviting me to share my opinions. I have five minutes assigned to me, so I, I will be brief and a bit superficial. I will try to answer Paca's question, but I'll do it by presenting three points that I had prepared. And in listening to my colleagues, this will help us to visualize that this is not only about a technical matter, a technical reform, 
but we are talking about a political challenge of great importance. And I think that polarization exists today in a country like Colombia, which we are right now seeing in this forums chat talks about the importance and the sensitivity of this matter. I would like to start by pointing out that the percep perception of the legitimacy of the police force and also the legitimacy of the use of force are obviously at the center of uh, the debate on how the security sector and defense sectors need to operate. This is an observation that we could uh, tie to uh, democracy and rule of law there is an issue of a lack of legitimacy and a lack of trust not only regarding the police but also regarding the state in general in colombia and also in the face of democracy and this is, this is present in the region and around the world as well so there's an interesting dissonance between the reforms that we have heard from the general that are ongoing or have been implemented that undoubtedly are very important but there is also another political reality where not, not only in Colombia, but in Latin America and the world, as the DCAP uh, publication highlights, there are issues, of, deep issues of trust from citizens and the police force. So we need to ask why, if the, so many reforms have been implemented, so many actions have been taken to correct the course of police action and adapt it to the needs of countries like Colombia, why does the police have so little, so, such lack of trust from society or citizens? And I think the report provides a good diagnosis, but I would just like to suggest that in the day-to-day -day actions, what we see on the streets in a country like Colombia, especially in our big cities, are patrolmen, essentially, we're not even talking about officers, patrolmen that do not say hello, that frisk people that uh, indiscriminately that ask for bribes and uh, in the eyes of citizens, of some citizens, they do race profiling, ethnic profiling, uh, social class profiling. And as the report says, it operates very logic as us versus them not to even not to talk about uh, and this is something that is typical not only in colombia but in the americas in general including the united states social protests in colombia basically have had the effect of aggravating this uh, lack of trust in the police and if we think about the report from the inter-american commission on human rights which President Duque has not taken into account in manifest is preoccupation. I quote on the disproportionate use of force and violence, gender-based violence, ethnic and social violence, violence against journalists and medical missions and irregularities and uh, disappearances, not to talk about the high number of deaths and wounded members of society and the police. As we heard in the beginning, we are not only talking about problems from that have affected uh, civil society, but also the police forces as well. This is the first point I have already uh, used up my time, but let me please finish with my other two ideas. The police is at the center of these debates, but as Ambassador Gruber said, the police is the visible face of the state. And we, this is something that we need to highlight because the problem is not, and the problem, the problem is not limited to this institution. It is a statewide matter and it also concerns civil entities. And here we see several obstacles, uh, obstacles to a, a, a deep reform. Number one, the lack of trust is, as I said, palpable because the police is supposedly the one that know about leadership. So reforms need to come from within and they need to be more technical than political. Number two, there are transactional dynamics that are very evident and of between civilians, both of the executive and the legislative and the police forces. 
that reflect the political spectrum of a country like Colombia and that they produce corruption and other practices. And unlike the senator, I think that yes, there are, there are there's a lack of political incentives to combat issues like corruption, the excess use of force, and also demand transparency and accountability. Because if we, from an electoral point of view, uh, an integral reform of the police does cannot serve political interests and it is such a polarized concept that a president that proposes a police reform will not have political success. And we also need to talk about, we need a good department that controls corruption, accountability, correct use of force, and it needs to create a culture of openness to external oversight and internal oversight. And if I may, I wish to explain my last idea. The report also talks about the need to incorporate a differential, differential, differentiating and intersectoral approach. This has been shown to reduce the excess use of force among the police. I think that the police is doing a good job in incorporating these lenses in their view, but I have to say that since 2018, there is a public sector approach to gender that is just a public guideline that has not been implemented about the police force. So I think that beyond human rights, a gender-based approach from within and from without in their daily actions of the police force is something that will strengthen other measures when we discuss how to accompany, oversee, demand accountability on, on the use of force. I'm sorry if I took so much time. Thank you, Arlene. And I think that it is necessary to insist on the fact that this issue is very controversial, that these approaches are controversial. As you said, we already see it in the chat, or we also see it every day in the news, the radio, and I think that the important, the importance of these types of events is that we can have a dialogue with those that don't think like us. The only thing that we can do to grow as a society is to listen to others, listen to those that have their own perspective. And I think that is what is very important about these types of events. So thank you, Arlene. As I said, I want to ask General, General Garcia and then President of the Countries and then Arlene, if you wanted to comment on what the others have said. So I want to start with General Garcia. Thank you, Paca. Yes, one of the central issues of our police transformation is that when, because when we talk about transformation, we talk about police culture. So any institutional adjustments that we are undertaking have to do basically with the impact on the performance and behavior of our policemen and women. We need to validate standards, competencies, skills on a systemic basis, including important measures that need to be taken administratively they're going to be substantial. And they come out of this very important dialogue that we had and are having with civil society, the current transformation process, 
contemplates this further dialogue with the civil entities and many of the documents and evidence that we have gathered Accountability is substantial. The evidence that we have gathered need to impact the decision-making in disciplinary terms, in administrative terms, and to improve police performance. This is why accountability because one of the central issues of this project is that of the project is that we are furthering the scope of accountability throughout the organization. We are making emphasis on the importance of citizen participation to have a system of guarantees to access an online consultation for citizens to under follow up on their claims. And I think that this will have a profound impact on police culture. The second uh, aspect, which is the reform to the career of a policeman or woman, we, provide guidelines because we are creating also standards. These standards will have a commission with members of different ministries where we are going to analyze inputs from society and create better standards on the use of force a, a service to society these are the themes that we have identified within we will develop the minimum standards for the professional career and we think that this philosophy is a very innovative which is part of Decree Bill 32 to validate the skills and the abilities of our policemen or women. I think that it is important and we have considered it as such the impact on improving police culture has to have to do with accountability standards, better disciplinary code, the Human Rights Commission within the police and we feel that many of the issues that we have tackled so far today, this morning, have important inputs for the police. And we are going to continue to work. This is our challenge and the purpose of this process of transformation, transforming the police. I don't know if the President of Congress has uh, a comment. Arlene, do you have a final comment before we move on? Just two things. I see that uh, on the chat, there are many members of the police forces, both from Colombia and abroad. And I wish to be clear because I uh, have questions regarding the human rights of the police. And I think that the conversation has been polarized so much that there is this false dichotomy on that those that criticize the excess use of force are not taking into account that policemen and women are human beings that suffer and that have rights. I think that this is this binary thinking that we need to overcome to be able to have uh, a discussion that is enriching both in terms of thinking public safety in an integral manner, also thinking about the well being of the police force. And I think that the report places great emphasis on this issue. And I wanted to call your attention upon that fact. The second thing is uh, dialogues with society. I celebrate all attempts of dialogue from the national government and also from 
defense institutions, but in my personal experience, at least, these are dialogues and conversations that do not involve deep mutual listening to each other and where the debate points are all are predetermined. What I think that we are missing is to think about the need to listen to each other deeply, trying to understand both what the other party needs, uh, for example, society in their diversity and multiplicity, and also what the police forces think and need, and obviously civil and political authorities that, that should be in charge of this institutionality. This is something that we need to also imagine, these, these scenarios where this deep listening takes place in a genuine manner, much more so than we have seen so far. Thank you, Arlene. I think this is very important to hear. Communication is among the two or three or five actors, but each other has to be able to talk and listen. Sometimes it is easier to say that it's the other party that is not listening. And is, this is a vital contribution. Thank you, Arlene. Now we will talk to Ambassador Pinzon. The ambassador has worked on several reforms and knows that public policy recommendations are always easier than implementing them. He knows that designs and documents and have difficulties in reaching an agreement. They are difficult to agree and uh, to agree on their design, but the greatest difficulty is when implementing them. And this is why I wanted the ambassador to talk about the institutionality in Colombia that is there to monitor, supervise, and control the use of force. How can we take advantage of these recommendations on the matter and the models, models for monitoring, supervision, and control in practice for the use of force in practice? And as he has information from other countries, it would be good to hear from him on this. Go ahead, Ambassador. Thank you, Paca. Are you listening? Can you hear me okay? Yes, okay. I'm always pleased to be in these events with you, Paca. For those of you that do not recall, Paca Suleta is one of the best public officials that we have had. And at now at University of Los Andes, the School of Government, she's trying to promote a good public service, the public officials that have ethics and training to provide a better service to our country. So I'm always delighted to be with you and your events. I also wish to say hello to Cristina Hoyos and Natalia at DCAF that are very committed to holding these events and promoting these events. I think that is a wonderful endeavor. Also, a thank you to Ambassador Gruber for his remarks and his attendance and also to the director of the police, General Vargas, which is not with us today, but he sent a de his deputy, General Garcia, that has the mission of transforming the police force. Arlene, a very serious academic, Uvacero, an expert, and last but not least, a very heartfelt thank you to the President of the Congress of the Republic, Senator Juan Diego Gomez, a man of character that understands these issues. That has provided a great service to his country. I wish to also welcome everybody that is tuned in with us today and another special thank you to our men and women in uniform that are 
putting their lives at risk to defend our principles and so that others can have a democratic conversation and a democratic way of life to all of them, my respects and my consideration. I was invited to, I was invited to this event before I became ambassador. So now my comments need to be uh, placed within certain boundaries and act as a responsible public official. But I think that I can provide some reflections. And it, the first one is a, a historical reflection because in Colombia, we have institutions that are very prone to reform, unlike the rest of Latin America. And just to talk about the police, I would like to mention three highlights. This police that needed to be remade in the 50s in Colombia because many people made it a political institution. And even though the police force was born in the 19th century, in the 1950s, it was necessary to close them and re remake it, but with the inputs from international experts and the carabineros from Chile that helped us design a police force that was suitable for our country. Then we went to, through the tragedy of the drug cartels of the 80s and 90s, where we also needed to go into a deep reform of the police force. We had to retire many officials because of ties drug trafficking and corruptions and before plan colombia the police started to work on the relationship with u.s law enforcement institutions da fbi that started to provide skills trainings and standards to our police force that at least for their for the elite squadrons have made one of the most successful and important police forces in the world in terms of intelligence, in terms of criminal investigation, and in terms of operations against organized criminal organizations. And a third watershed moment was at the beginning of the 21st century, which was derived from the prestige obtained by the hard work of our policemen and women a lot have given their lives and have lost their integrity to provide us with democracy principles and liberties and they lost their lives fighting against criminals so uh, at the beginning of the 21st century uh, it, colombia was made an important member of Interpol. We still have a close ties with Interpol. And the most important thing is that through an agreement that we signed and I signed personally as minister in 2012, we created the Colombia United States program to support countries around the world. And as a result, thousands of police, men and women from Honduras, El Bador, Republica Dominicana, Ecuador, Chile, Argentina, and other 50 countries around the world have received or are receiving training because our policemen are there on the ground training or their policemen and women have come to our police schools created with this agreement between the US and Colombia. When we created the anti-rioting squad, the ESMAD, it was created on the basis of international standards. This squad was not created ad hoc because we thought that we needed to have it. We used the standards of the Spanish police force and our policemen and women went to Spain to train and come back with this knowledge. 
the poli Spanish police force has deep ties with the French and German police forces, very rich. So we need to place ourselves in this context to have a proper point of view. Another important element of this discussion is that, and I have said this so publicly, which is that I regret the low budgets and low headcount that our police forces have suffered in recent years. We reduced investment as part of GDP and in our police forces. And I think that it was a big mistake and those that made this mistake need to be held accountable because doing so in a period where we expect, expected going to a post-conflict scenario that we were going to take back our territories left behind by criminal organizations. This is where we needed more police and more equipment and more skills. The police force that I left behind in June of 2015 had 133,000 men and women. A year ago, the police force was 160,000 or less. Now it's about around 163,000. There's a debate because a ruling of the state council, but this is something that was not done properly. And the only thing that we know today is that in the light of recent events and social protests have occurred in a police force that has been weakened in terms of headcount, in terms of resources, in terms of skills and capacity. And this, we need to ask the question, why those that needed to create a good police force didn't do so? My final reflection is that we have been seeing, and not in Colombia, but throughout the world, particularly in strong democracies or where people feel that they have the right to express themselves, we see an increase in presence of civil society on the streets and recurring expressions, increasingly stronger expressions of what we call social protest. And Colombia is not the exception. And the United States, Chile, Spain, France have been the exception. So I think that we need to put it on the table and not to talk about what, not to say uh, what happened in Hong Kong that what used to be a democracy and ceased to be so. So I think that we cannot lose perspective of what is happening around the world. Now, regarding Colombia, I think that it's absolutely clear that our democracy, the right to social protest is part of our character of part of our society, freedom of speech, the ability for a citizen to speak against, speak his mind and speak against the government if, if, if so. This is a basic democratic tenant and we need to promote it and develop it. I think that the schools of government, the schools of public policy in general have to make better citizens in terms of motivating us to participate in political life and exercise our political rights and do it by expressing our opinions. The pandemic obviously was a global tragedy and Colombia was suffered a deep blow. Colombia had 2 million more people on employment list and 3 million people that went below the poverty line. Once again, what the country did in 20 years we backtracked in this one year, 2020. And what does this mean? People that are hungry, that are living in anguish, young people without hope that take to the streets to protest, that take to the streets to express their feelings. Obviously, it is the duty of the national police to accompany this protest under two perspectives. Number one, protect the public so that they can exercise their right and protect other citizens in the event of violent acts that obligate the police force to protect property rights, human rights of the other citizens. And this is where we need to be aware of the context. The police 
have powers derived not only from the Constitution of 1991, but also, as General Garcia explained, they exist since 2016. There is, since 2016, a police code that obligates the police to regulate its relationship with the society. So when, when people face each other on the streets, the police is the force that needs to be there to regulate that conversation and reach a peaceful solution. The police had to take to the streets as well in May. And yes, we have to say it, whether there have been excess use of force, yes, it could have been, but when we have a police force that does, have, that does not have enough headcount to guarantee that they need the resources, the training uh, that they need. Right now, we should have a police force that is 200,000 plus, but it is 160,000. Why should it have been so big? Because they need to have proper cycles, training, activity and rest. And when we have social protest, we can bring in more additional capacity where needed. We see these situations in Cali, then in Bogota. We obviously have regrettable events that took place. We also saw in 2019, uh, excess force that led to the death of a citizen. This is similar to what we have seen in other countries. This is not something that happens only in Colombia. So in, in summary, what do, that having said all of this, the police and the government of President Duque Ministry Molano and the director of the police, the General Jorge Vargas. I celebrate that they not only tried to ensure that police action were, were made under the criteria that are framed in the Colombian system, which is the respect for human rights. And obviously the individual consequences where human rights have been violated that each person or police man or woman has to face, but they then proposed a reform that wishes to strengthen training standards and certifications, and they also wants to increase the headcount so that we can adapt our police force, as we have done in prior decades, adapt the police force to the challenges of the present and the future. So I think that this is a necessary step towards this natural evolution. I leave you with this question. For many Colombians, what has been lacking is effective action by the authorities. There, there is a public perception that there are mayors and public officials that have not done enough to protect the citizens and to defend a public private, uh, public property, private property and human rights. We saw last night that people decided in Bogota to destroy public property. One of the issues that we need to debate in Colombia, and this is why I thought the intervention of the president of the Congress was so brilliant because he is an expert on this issue and that we need to think about it in three dimensions. Number one, the career of the policeman or woman and the reforms that we need to make there but also criminal issues, because we have been seeing commission of crimes and what we see is generalized impunity. How can we contain this impunity? And three, number three, obviously, we need to effectively regulate the, the important right to protest. What is the degree of leg legitimacy that we can give to a, a violent protest. We have seen patients die because they couldn't get to a hospital. Uh, people have lost their businesses because they were destroyed in a protest. The public transport system has been destroyed. How do we frame everything, all of this within the legitimacy, legitimacy of public protest? I think it was a good way to tie off this conversation. Excuse me, Paca, if I took too long, but I feel that the country needs to think deeply 
on these matters. This is not black or white. We need to understand our history. We need to understand current capacity. And we also need to have a future facing perspective on the challenges that we are facing as a society. Yes, I understand. I understand you. We, I, I knew that uh, time management was is going to be tricky, but I think that uh, we have had success so far, and I thank you. Now we have with us Mama Liliana Pechene Muelas. And her being with us today is very significant because she can give us a, a very unique perspective on the use of force. So what I wanted is for her to provide her reflections on the governance of police force in terms of the diversity of the terri Colombian territory, cultural, political diversity, and what she thinks are the challenges to avoid or minimize discrimination in the use of force in Colombia. Welcome, Mama Pechene. Yes, thank you for the invitation. I want to say hello to everybody with us here today. Um, we are losing sound. First of all, I would like to say that the indigenous perspective is, is very important in this debate. The state has We need to ask, even though indigenous communities and ethnical diversity is recognized by the political constitution, unfortunately, over the past 30 years, 30 years of recognition, yes, but 30 years of deep differences regarding our view of what the state should be and our participation in exercising our constitutional rights. And I think that a fundamental part of this perspective is how over the last 30 years, we have seen a discrimination that is based on a pyramid hierarchy where there are some superiors and some inferiors and this has created deep damage to our democracy and has bred institutional mistrust and this lack of trust that have, has deepened throughout a conflict that does not belong to our territories, that does not belong to our indigenous communities, that does not belong to any of the rural communities of this beautiful country. This lack of equality that I think is part of the deep need of many citizens to forge their lives and their institutional trust towards a much more inclusive and equitable perspective in building the state because we are the state. And sometimes we are not invited to these spaces including reform to security forces and police re and policy reform. Regarding your question, I wanted to say that unlike many other countries, despite the fact that we live in, in a lack of equality, we live under a view of security that is focused on the city centers We do not feel that it, there is a security that reaches throughout the national territory. 
that promotes citizen coexistence. In our rural communities, these are things that are that feel far from us. It shouldn't be so, but it is part of this lack of trust. It's part of the basic conflicts that have existed in our territories. And this is why we are demanding peace, not only as a right, but also as an urgent need for our territories. And that today, unfortunately, since the peace agreements were signed in 2016, we have lost 1,200 leaders that are peasants, indigenous member, leaders, and guaranteeing their life has not been observed. And we have had to take our own security measures to guarantee our survival. And these conflicts are part of our rural life today. And that the logic of security for rural sectors is intermittent and in other parts inexistent. We do not feel the presence of the state in many of parts of the country. So these policies for us are things that are very far away and they should be close to us. They should be much more respectful. And in terms of the use of force, we expect that the reactions respect the right to our life as established in the constitution and that as representatives of the state, police forces can answer to the calling given to them, even though they our, our relationship with them has not been the best. This creates further gaps between us, creates much more distance. On the last social protest is a, a people that is tired of the violence from the right and from the left, and a people that is tired of the structural oppression. And when they receive violence, from the state and from the police force has not been the best way to create peace and create our country. So unfortunately, we continue to see indigenous communities as tied to the past or exotic. Yes, they are very pretty, but they are not part of the country, but as a place that is far away, you see us as maybe sometimes you do not see us. And in many, and, and in the media, they call us the cause of criminality. That is not so. I think that we need to understand our country. We need to understand our diversity. Not diversity as a word on paper, but and not only in terms of ethnic representation, but understand our ways of thinking and our ways of building, because we are also part of this country. You see us as the criminals. And in many case, cases, you demonize us. So part of our challenge, was the institutional challenge, but also challenges regarding the deep needed reforms we need to build with the inputs of civil society because we call in a group of, civil, of international experts that do not understand the realities of our countries, that do not understand rural life. It is very difficult to build trust. And another thing that is very important throughout this process is to have a dialogue, a dialogue with, with all stakeholders, even if this makes it 
much com cumbersome and time consuming, but I think it's the only way out to be able to be constructive and improve society as a whole. This is why it is important. Because sometimes you hear that there is a new department regarding human rights and we hear about these experts and these public officials, but in terms of protection of human rights and our lives, it should be the policy of each person that is in the public armed forces and also the policy of the Ministry of Defense. They need to deepen and place a transversal access of human rights and not translate the responsibility to a department or an office. This needs to be not only on paper, it needs to go out and change society and improve dialogue. This is what will allow us to build democracy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mentioned Hugo Acero has a great advantage from the point of view of cities and the because he was secretary for security and is currently secretary for security in the city of Bogota. And he has this very practical knowledge, hands-on knowledge about how to manage shared leadership because the police is a national force, but also the district is the district of Bogota. For those of you of Mexi from Mexico, Peru, Ecuador, there is the national government, but Bogota is the capital district that constitutionally has like the second place in the hierarchy. And as a consequence, Hugo had the task of managing this shared leadership responsibility and articulate the leadership from the national level and the district level. And I wanted to ask him what he would add to the recommendations of the CAF document to implement the, the governance of the use of police force from the city perspective and how to manage these shared leadership between the national and district levels, which can also happen in Mexico at the Mexico City level. Thank you, Paca, to all my of you with us today. Hello and welcome. You just mentioned that we have international viewers and I understand that this is a very important perspective that they bring. And I can tell you that I have been working not only in Bogota, but I've been working with the countries from the Southern Florida to the Patagonia. And I understand many of these realities. And what, and what do we see throughout Latin America? We see police forces that are tied to secretaries, ministers, which are often independent of the military forces. This is what we see in most Latin American countries, Mexico and beyond. We have ministries, we have district secretaries. In Colombia, the police is under the Ministry of Defense. And in this discussion on police reform, we are looking at alternatives and this document brings uh, as an important element to the rule of law that police forces should not fall under the hierarchy of ministries of defense. They should be under the Ministry of the Interior, Ministry of Justice, for example. And in the case of Colombia, we have proposed 
from within the institutions, but also we have seen many publications on this matter that we need to reform the Ministry of Defense, dividing it between defense and civil security. They're looking at proposals for the police to fall under the Ministry of Justice or the Interior, or maybe a new ministry, as we once heard from President Juan Manuel Santos. What do we find in Latin America? That we have national police forces, but there are also countries. There are many local police forces in Mexico, Argentina, Brazil, where we have federal police forces and even municipal forces. But there's also variety in terms of the responsibilities of mayors. There are countries where mayors are not responsible for security. The governors are not responsible for security. It is exclusively a national security. In Colombia, we, it is shared. It is not decentralized. This is a delegated responsibility. The responsibility falls to the president of the republic, and it has been delegated to mayors and governors. In, in these terms, mayors and governors are agents of the president, and the orders of the president prevail over the orders of governors, and these prevail over the orders made by mayors. And in Colombia, the police is one of the forces that have the right to use force. And here I touch upon an important subject, which is this indiscriminate use of force in all its modalities, not only in terms of control of social protests, but also in daily life and the relationship of police with the community. And it is that there are differences when we apply or use force. This led me once to write an article that I titled uh, Discrimination Based on Your Face, because this is the way police sometimes do their jobs. They discriminate because of the way you look. This is what I saw in the way that police forces relate to citizens. But at the local level, I think that it is in the way that local administrations relate to this issue of security, and in particular, with the use of force. And it is a, what we need is permanent teamwork. What we see in some regions is that we do not work as a team or we do so based on certain circumstances. I think that we need to work as a team permanently. I think that local administrations need to work in tandem with all stakeholders, and this needs to involve citizens as well. We need to involve ample participation by civil society to understand how to manage, how to govern security. And I think that this permanent work as a team makes us, provides greater understanding of the problems. What else can local administrations do when they are not directly responsible for security? And when it is delegated in the case of Colombia, and for example, Mayor Antanas Mocos in Bogota, he designed a program called Trainer of Trainers. And as the study said, this is not only about uh, human rights trainings and protocols, it goes beyond. What did this Trainer of Trainers program want? That the police force and all policemen and women, everybody from the top to the bottom, understand in practice the, diff the practical differences, the, the social diversity that we live under and the diversity of social problems that we have and how to tackle them. These were trainings where they worked 
where minorities with young people, and there we have the police, and we understand, begin to understand the social groups. Yes. The country is not only the big cities, but we have our rural areas that need to be understood in their complexity, in their culture, and in their expressions. What the local administrations can do is, on top of this training, on top of the education of the police forces, we need to have trainings that involve the citizens and involve the citizens problems and needs. In Bogota, we have made progress with these trainings that started in the 90s. And an important element here that this study has, because this study is focused on gender, but beyond gender, we also need to look at differential approaches. I would go even beyond. I think that institutionality not only be taken to respect diversity, but institutions themselves need to be diverse to understand part of the problem. Diverse populations, especially in the armed forces, and here I include the police, they, there's a high level of discrimination within and also without. And in this sense, as a diverse institution acts accordingly. And this is where I tie the issue of training and diversity. There's another experience that we saw in Bogota in the relationship between the police forces and citizens. This started with the civic guides of Enrique Peñaloso and the mimes of Antanas Mocus and the coexistence groups currently. I received 156 and I handed back 320 of these where they were, where we included many diverse and minority groups, which are a group of young people that mediate in different conflicts, not only marches and protests, but in daily lives of the communities and the police forces. It has been so important for Bogota that other municipalities have opened it and it has included in the code. And it has been so important for the country that in the case of Brazil in Pernambuco, Bolsonaro started to look at this as well. So this is an experience that we can share. And I will I'm going to share a document in this regard. And the other issue is participation. We need to create social capital. Not only for security, but other sectors of society, because this guarantees oversight, but also growth and development. So we need to strengthen our social capital. Colombia has falling in this regard, Bogota has been falling in this regard, and we need to strengthen it back up because it is a fundamental part of democracy. And I think that it is enough, it is not enough to have protocols and regulation, we need to disseminate them. Sometimes we think that dissemination is that they appear in the public gazette, no, in the official gazette, no, we need to do simple actions and simple communications that everybody understands in terms of what is the protocol for the legitimate use of force that people regulate and control this themselves in practice in the streets, but also in organizations. So there is a relationship between national authorities, police forces, and citizens. And throughout these three, there needs to be a joint work that allows us to understand how to better use police force and at what times as an exceptional manner we should use 
force legitimately. So I think that I have talked about the ideas regarding uh, local perspective. And as I said, in Latin America, we have different contexts. In some countries, mayors are not responsible for security, not neither delegated nor decentralized. In others, they have a decentralized responsibility like Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, and they have their own police forces. So there are important differences there. In general terms, the text is in terms of rule of law, accountability, and human rights. I think that these elements are very important. There could be some additions, as I mentioned, but in general terms, this publication is a body of work that will allow our police forces in Latin America and the states themselves to understand the complexity of the legitimate use of force, but also understand the logic within the governance of security. That would be it for me. Mil, mil, mil gracias. Muchas, muchas gracias. Thank you, Hugo. La, la And the activity in our chat has been very ample. There is a different pers there are different per perspectives expressed there. There are many questions regarding how to implement these reforms and how to maintain a spirit of reform. As Arlene said in the chat, we see the polarization play out clearly. We also see the idea uh, we also see that this idea that there is a magic solution, a magic formula but there, that is a dream and also the fact that one thing is what we write down on paper and what the other is what we are able to implement and i think that as hugo mentioned we have important experience in bogota but we also saw that they brought this same system to other cities in like colombia and it did not work so this is why understanding the context is so important. And we need to revisit what we invited the president of the countries to do, which is to continue with this spirit of reform. Because there is no one big reform that will change everything. We need sm several small reforms that allow us to build a better future. I invite you to make a step out of polarization and stop dividing the world between good and bad. We, we are all somewhere in the middle or, and we are all need, need to improve. Nobody's perfect, no institution is. Nobody's perfect, no institution is perfect. Arlene, thank you for being with us. Bill, I know that you had class to teach. Lina has already answered many questions. And I invite you to do two things. To read the documents, which we will publish shortly. We are going to publish the answers to these, the questions in the chat. And we also have some emails. And we will send to these emails information regarding the links. And as I said, we will publish on, web, on our websites. I don't know if, I don't know if Liliana wants to, if anybody has something to say about the comments of the their fellow panelists? No, eh, no, eh, quiero agradecer. Oh, yes, I have to go teach a class. I tried to answer some of the questions that I thought I could answer. 
there were some technical questions. And the message I want to leave you with is that this is a very polarized debate, but it is tied to a, a broader discussion about the character of the state itself, the state that we all wish for and, and want. So to talk about police reform in isolation from a, a more ample debate about the state and the making this debate political, which is not, which is toxic and we need to stop it. I celebrate these sort of encounters and we need many more to continue to discuss and debate. Hugo, it's among many other things, I think that we need to look back and understand that all of, the, all of this has happened in the, in the midst of a pandemic. And all sectors of society have seen social protests that have turned violent and the police has had to intervene but also in the midst of the pandemic, how do we bring people together? How do we create a community? And the other issue has to do with protests themselves, the way that they have been growing, the way that have been behaving, they have modified radically. The pandemic also modified, the, not the pandemic itself, but the context modified the way social protest evolved. As the ambassador said, for the whole of May, there was no day where we had 8, 10, 20 social protests that we, the police had to accompany, all of them different. And here I have to recognize that the police had to work between 16 and 18 hours a day to try to help. And this has its effects, its impacts. Some are still to be seen and analyzed so I think that is a very rich and complex times that we are living through. And I think that this publication is very timely in terms of understanding how to guide and help throughout uh, these types of events. Thank you so much, Hugo. And thank you everybody. Thank you for being with us today. We had more than 1,600 people. It's amazing. Thank you, everybody. As I said, in the report, we will try to gather most, some of the questions that we saw here today. And I wish to thank everybody. And yes, this is an issue that we need to continue to work on. And try to communicate with those that think unlike ourselves. We need to continue to talk and improve our communication lines. These sort of events are very interesting, very interesting to understand that there are different perspectives and that this is crucial. This is a valuable part of democracy. So thank you, everybody. And hopefully we can meet together again. Thank you and goodbye. Gracias. Feliz día a todos. Gracias. Adiós. Muchas gracias a todos.